Hello and welcome to RGU Talk, the official podcast of Robert Gordon University. I'm your host, Johnny Milne, and we've got a very topical issue this week, nutrition and Scotland's diet. And I promise you this episode isn't just an excuse for me to get my own advice about my diet. Uh, I am joined by two excellent guests from RGU School of Pharmacy and Life Sciences. It's Dr. Lindsay Masson and Harriet Young. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. You don't need to look so nervous. <laughs> I know you're sleep deprived. Um, I mean, first of all, before we actually get into the topic at hand, you were both telling me about how sleep deprived you were before we started recording. May I ask why? <laughs> Lindsay, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Harriet. I, I'm a relatively new kitten mum. I've got two two kittens and the female kitten's a bit of a nightmare at the moment oh and no she, <laughs> she keeps meowing and pawing me in the middle of the night and i'm too soft to shut her out the door to shut her out the room <laughs> i mean at least it, me- it means you're popular she loves me very much you're doing a good job but i need to train her better so it's it's my own fault really i should have trained her when she was younger better <laughs> and harriet um i'm having what some people might say is a mid midlife crisis and I have just recently bought a van to convert into a camper van so I was down in the south of England buying a van yesterday and I drove it up to Aberdeen this morning. (laughs) That is I mean I've known you pretty much our entire (laughs) life and that is that is impressive. (laughs) Okay well on to the actual topic at hand and for those people who might think of the name you know School of Pharmacy and Life Sciences and think that's pretty broad sounding What exactly are your areas of expertise at the university? Well, I am the course leader for the BSE in Food, Nutrition and Human Health, which is a a, a new course. We are phasing out our BSE Nutrition, which is still in existence at the moment, and we're phasing in the BSE Food, Nutrition and Human Health. So I'm a lecturer in nutrition, and a registered nutritionist as well, as is Harriet. And apart from the nutrition courses, the School of Pharmacy and Life Sciences also has courses in pharmacy, obviously, but also forensic and analytical science, biomedical science, applied bioscience. Mm -hmm. So that comes under the life sciences umbrella. Okay. And Harriet, you're obviously nutrition as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything um, particular that you do at the university that you're we'd want to mention um i say i just support the uh, the nutrition and the, the new now food nutrition and human health course i'm also one of the registered nutritionists um on the team and um i take a lot as well of the outreach and the recruitment of the course i play a sort of a role in that as well okay well Lindsay, you've been all over the news in recent weeks from the bbc to the and stv to the galloway gazette and all manner of regional newspapers because of a new study you conducted into Scotland's diet. So can you tell us more um, about the study, you know, how it came about and what exactly was involved? Sure, this was a study funded by Food Standards Scotland and its main purpose was to monitor progress of the Scottish population to meeting the Scottish dietary goals. And the Scottish dietary goals, there are a set of goals that include uh, both foods and nutrients for the Scottish population to achieve which would hopefully reduce the burden, the burden of obesity, heart disease, cancer um, and ill health. So the study involved essentially secondary analysis of data from the Living Costs and Food Survey, which is a national survey. And every year people are asked to keep a record of everything that they purchase. And we were particularly interested in the Scottish data. And because it's looking at purchase data, we need to make adjustments for waste because not everything that's bought is eaten. Of course, yeah. Uh, and we essentially looked to see what the average intake was in the Scottish population and we compared that with the Scottish Dietary Goals. We have similar data for the last 15 years, for actually from 2001 to 2015, so we could look and see whether the diet has changed overall and we could also see whether there are certain pockets of the population that have a poorer diet than others, so perhaps whether those in more deprived areas Mm. have a, a different diet from those in least deprived areas. And um, how did the study came about because I understand you worked with um, a number of partners during this. Yes, so I worked with Karen Barton at the University of Aberdeen and Wendy Reading at the University of Newcastle and we also had advisors from Dundee University, Glasgow University and Glasgow Caledonian University. 
And my colleagues at Newcastle and Aberty, they have been involved with this analysis for several years. So this was actually an extension to okay. the work that they had previously done. And I have previously uh, been principal investigator for Food Standards Scotland's funded survey of diet and children in Scotland. So my expertise fitted in well with, with their expertise in terms of monitoring the Scottish diet. Fantastic. And uh, I mean, comparing the Scottish diet with the dietary goals, what were the main findings you found? Well, essentially, the Scottish diet is it's it's not great it's <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us something we don't know <laughs> it's not it's it's not great oh, we all know this but we really need to improve our diet mm-hmm. so the scottish population we are not meeting recommendations for total fat for saturated fat for free sugars these are the added sugars that we find in confectionery biscuits cakes pastries sugary drinks we're not meeting recommendations for fiber our fiber intake is really low and this is really important for for bowel health and preventing colorectal cancer for instance And we're also not meeting the food-based recommendations for oily fish and for fruit and vegetables. So we're not meeting recommendations. And we also found that essentially there's been little change over the last 15 years in our dietary intake. There's been perhaps a slight reduction in our intake of free sugars. And that's mirrored by a slight reduction that we see in sugary drinks. So Mm -hmm. we think sugary drinks are being replaced by the, the more diet drinks. So that's a slight improvement, but we are really very very far away from meeting recommendations and this is contributing to dental decay and obesity and all you know a host of other non-communicable diseases i mean i I, when i read the study and saw the fact as you've just said there's been little change over 15 years Mm -hmm. i was despite being a larger gentleman myself i was completely taken aback but i mean is it something you were surprised by and harriet when you were made aware of it all does it surprise you with the work you do um, yes and no. It, it, is, it is surprising statistics, but it is something that we do know. Um, I think part of it is it's, it's not so much, I think we're doing a lot of work on education and educating people and people know this. People know that they need to eat less sugar. People know that they need to have oily fish. People know the five a day message. Everyone can tell you that, but it's about putting it into practice. Um, and it's translating the knowledge and awareness into behavioural change, I think, is, is one of the issues. Another area which I'm, I've been doing a little bit of work with with my teaching is looking at the food and drink industry as well. And I think there is a lot to consider with the food and drink environment in which consumers make their food choices now, you know, in- including where consumers shop, where they eat out of the home. And I think that might be sort of a step, a step forward into improving the Scottish diet. Okay. There, there's been some positive response with um, reformulation, for example, the salt reduction um, has, has proven some successes in terms of reducing the, the salt intake of, of the population, um, but I still think there needs to be perhaps more uh, work into reformulation, portion sizes, out of home um, eateries, in order to allow people to, to make those positive changes mm-hmm. and make their choices healthier with the help from food and drink manufacturers and industry. Uh, well, obviously, you know, the government and various organisations like Food Standards Scotland have spent years running campaigns mm-hmm. about healthy eating, as you say, you know, the five a day and so on. We all know these things. But if they've had seemingly negligible results, is there anything that people can do to make a difference in, in their own lives, their families' lives? Can I just give a bit, a bit of history, first of all, to the Scottish Dietary Goals? They actually started out their life as the Scottish Dietary Targets. They were published in 1996 as part of the Scottish Diet Action Plan, originally intended to be achieved by 2005. Oh gosh, the timeline okay. was then extended to 2010, Okay, and our, our data goes up to 2015. Mm-hmm. So over these years, the Scottish Dietary Targets and then the Scottish Dietary Goals, they've been updated to reflect new evidence, but the diet has not changed and I think it's important that we actually sit down and say okay things are not changing campaigns are not working why are we not translating this knowledge and awareness into behavior change because we all know what well what's the recommendation Johnny for fruit and vegetable intake uh five a day see we know yeah. this do you eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day now I'm going to be honest and say for a while I did Um, But you just need to look at me to go, it didn't stick. But you see, this is what we need to understand. Mm -hmm. Why are we not translating this knowledge into behaviour change? Why can't we do that? This is where we need more research. Um, Well, 
Harriet, I know mm-hmm. you do a lot of out- outreach work uh, with schools in the Northeast. Um, mm-hmm. What, first of all, what does that involve? So as, as part of sort of um, RGU's outreach sort of programme, we've been involved with um, a number of events at local primary schools, certainly over the last year in, in particular, to promote sort of nutrition and healthy eating. And these usually tend to feed into healthy eating weeks that the schools themselves are running. So you can already tell the sort of shift that the schools are doing in order to promote healthy eating. Um, in terms of what we do there, um, they're always really, really good fun events. Um, they usually involve some form of practical activities around food, such as guess the sugar in the drink game, um, making healthy ladybird pizzas, um, or a popular favourite is the smoothie bike, where the um, children have to pedal a bike that's attached to a blender in order to make a delicious smoothie. Um, the only caveat with that is I make sure there's some form of vegetable in that smoothie, which doesn't always get initially a great reception um, but once they um, get absorbed into the fun and they're pedaling and they actually get a chance to make this smoothie um, they soon forget it's in there they're all drinking it they're all um, enjoying it and they come up and tell me I actually love that spinach in that smoothie nice. I want to make this at home you know and it, it's just about getting them acknowledging different nutrients what how, how different nutrients do in the body um, and I've generally been actually really impressed and I think going back to what Lindsay said if I ask them okay so how many pieces of fruit and vegetables should we have they all say five they all know mm-hmm. um, what it is that they that they need to have and you know it's there's still work to be done with children's understanding and it's not been unheard that um a children ask me oh isn't milk comes from chickens isn't it Ooh, uh, okay. um oh my chicken nuggets has fish in it you know and i think perhaps there still needs to be a lot done in terms of children as well to f- allowing them to make meaningful links with their food which i think would translate into sort of healthy eating messages as well later on in life do you know it's interesting about the smoothies you mentioned because mm. people know that that contributes to your five a day but people won't know what the recommended intake is of fruit juice or smoothies they won't know that it's recommended we limit that to 150 mils or a Mm -hmm. small glass because of the sugar content Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of it so that's something that I suspect the general population are not aware of and they might be happily drinking all their fruit juice thinking oh I've got my five a day Mm -hmm. already and they're not thinking about the sugar content I I did many many years ago have a friend who just drunk non-stop Capri Suns thinking they counted in his five a day Mm -hmm. Um, take the work you are doing with children you know mm-hmm. it obviously sounds like they're quite receptive to the Absolutely. things you're telling them mm-hmm. do you think it's almost a generational thing that the maybe the the wrong advice they're getting is being passed down i know certainly growing up myself there was always that attitude of don't waste food because there's children mm-hmm. elsewhere in the world that you know would kill to get this um and obviously that's changed a lot nowadays but do you think children nowadays are still they're picking up on things perhaps their parents generations didn't know when it comes to nutrition um possibly you know as an example i I remember when i was younger i had um, children's books and it would say uh broccoli uh sprouts Mm. uh and i i think there's been a change in what we, how we educate children in terms of vegetables and fruit specifically. I think that used to be, I think there has been a change in that and I think children are a lot more receptive to understanding the need for fruit and vegetables mm-hmm. and certainly I, I did it with sort of primary fours, primary fives and I would say why do we, why do we need fruit and vegetables and Perhaps they didn't necessarily understand the meaning, but they said it's for vitamins and minerals. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's some, some, some messages are getting through at school, but it, it's, as Lindsay said, it's translating this into behaviour change. Yeah. But actually the curriculum for excellence does have food and nutrition in it. So yeah. I think, you know, that's, that is a positive step. So they mm-hmm. are learning more about that in, in schools. Um, and if Scotland's diet doesn't start to improve more, what's our worst case scenario you know are we heading for a situation like the humans in wally that's a really bad case it, it, but, but worst worst case scenario but what is you know it, it, what is the worst case scenario if we don't start getting better well i'm going to be provocative and say we're, we're nearly there already because the recent scottish health survey showed that 65 percent of adults are overweight or obese 65 percent that means it's actually normal Mm -hmm. to be overweight 
are obese. And that figure has been relatively constant since 2008. So for the last 10 years, similar to the Scottish diet, there's been little change in that. And you can talk about the fact that we live in an obesogenic environment which promotes sedentary behaviour and has got large portion sizes. So, you know, we're, we're, we're actually there already. We have a problem already, I would say. Okay. Um, and what tips would you both have for keeping a healthy diet? What would be, aside from the, you know, the, the standards, what would be your advice to people listening to this? I always say this and it is, it's boring. It's a boring tip and people always want a magic click of the fingers and the best tip. It is boring, but everything in moderation, Mm. you know, uh, eating in moderation, treats in moderation, um, being physically active, um, trying to have some form of sort of plant-based food with with your meals. Um, Another one that I've always found quite useful is having a range of colours in your meals, in your bowl, in your Tupperware, in your plate. Um, The more colours you have in your meals, the more likely you are to have a different range of vitamins and minerals. I'm not talking about a packet of Skittles. (laughs) I'm talking about more sort of uh, different coloured of fruit and vegetables Mm -hmm. alongside um, your sort of carbohydrate and your protein as well. And in terms of carbohydrate, to have whole grains. And yeah. that's a relatively simple swap that people can make, having whole grain rice instead of white rice. Or, And I know people say they don't like the taste of whole grain, but perhaps if you have whole grain, you know, wholemeal pasta, you're mm. going to be eating that with a, with a sauce and with vegetables, hopefully, <laughs> as well. So, you know, start with small changes. People aren't going to change their diets and their lifestyle overnight. So start yeah. with small changes, which you can then incorporate long term and sustain. Yeah, and I think you know an important message as well is food is there to be enjoyed. Mm-hmm. It's it's part of our enjoyment as, as as human beings, and it should you know it should be a balance of what's good for your heart and what's good for your soul. It's one of my favourite sayings. Oh wow, that was <laughs> cheesy, but in a good kind of way. Um, well, finally, I have to ask you know the big question: Do you both practice what you preach? Well, I made spiced apple cupcakes with lemon icing last night. Nice. They have got fruit in them, but they do also (laughs) have some (laughs) saturated fat (laughs) and sugar in them. But it's not all about you cannot eat this and you cannot have that. You know, Mm. you're allowed to have a treat. The problem is, is that people are having treats morning, afternoon and evening every day. Now, so it is in moderation, as Harriet said. I actually do eat quite a lot of fruit and vegetables Mm -hmm. and I eat, you know, I don't eat any processed meat Mm -hmm. now when I have my oily fish, but I do like my treats as well. Yeah, and it's same same goes. You know, everything in moderation. Keeping, I sort of like to try and keep active. I really love my food. I enjoy experimenting with new foods as well. So, um, and I think planning ahead is quite a good tip as well. It mm-hmm. saves me. I know myself if I have not quite planned a meal, then the temptation is there to to go and find something yeah. not so healthy to have. <laughs> well, on that, thank you both for sitting down with me. It's it's been eye-opening and hopefully it has for everyone listening in thanks johnny thanks johnny and that's it for another episode of rgu talk on behalf of the university i'm johnny milne and we'll talk to you later